Glad you're with us on The Perspective today. Julie, we got an interesting show. We certainly do. And one of the things that I feel makes it so interesting today is we're going to be talking about the end times. Mm -hmm. Are we living in the last days? What's, how do we perceive and understand what is happening in the world? Right. This is something we don't talk about too often, so it's going to be very interesting to hear. What you very interesting. And we have the CEO of uh, Cloud 10 Pictures, uh, Peter Lalonde, is with us today. And you know what? I discovered he just lives down the road from us. I know. <laughs> yeah, I thought we were getting this uh, amazing guy from the States. Now we're getting an extra amazing guy from That's right. Niagara Falls. Absolutely. Us Canadians, we got to stick together. We have to stick together. Peter, I want to <laughs> welcome you to the program today. Absolutely, my pleasure. And now that we know that you love Canada and that you are Canadian, did you have your Tim Hortons already? I did not, but I generally do. I'm also sitting here today anxiously awaiting the Toronto Maple Leaf hockey game tonight. Hope ah, it's better. There than you me. go. Can't get more Canadian than that. Peter, talk to us about your latest work. You've been involved in a lot of end time productions, end time books left behind, but you have a new launch of, uh, of a Bible prophecy on trial courtroom. Did I say that right? And can you explain what it's all about? Well, you said it exactly right. And yes, I can explain it. After years of, I was a prophetic teacher, spoke at, I don't know how many conferences. I made nine movies. Uh, I hosted a program called This Week in Bible Prophecy for over a decade with my brother, Paul, who is still Cloud 10 Pictures. By the way, I have uh, retired from that. Um, I just felt I wanted something interactive. I, you can sit in church and you hear your pastor talking about the end times, and you write down some notes, and you intend to study them later, and sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. I wanted to set a setting where it didn't matter what I believe or what I was saying to the jurors in this trial. It's what they believe. And so I formed it in the sense of a real prosecution. Here's the evidence. Here's the facts. Now it's time for you to render your verdict. And uh, I really believe in that concept so much so that it's probably become the main focus of my activities now. I love that. I think that's very interesting. What a, what a different way of approaching it. What, can, what made you come up with this idea? I think just from talking to people and watching the kind of glassy stare in their eyes, <laughs> uh, interpret it all and understand it all. And I really wanted to do a very organized, big picture view of what the story that we're really looking for here. And is it really happening? Or are we getting a little bit ahead of ourselves? I mean, the apostles thought they were living in the last days, and so have basically everybody since then. So is there evidence that suggests this generation is indeed drift, but different in a way that can be proven factually uh, according to the word of God? And again, I, I don't do it to question it, I do it because I believe it and I think that I can prove it. So I have a lot of fun doing it actually. So let's jump forward with this idea and, and come to today. And, and I want to ask you, you know, why has the merging of mankind with technology created a new Tower of Babel scenario, so to speak? What's your thoughts on that? Perfect question. It's interesting that today, um, I don't think there was any planning in this, but behind you is a cloud. And <laughs> I noticed that this morning, I'm like, this is perfect. <laughs> I've got a big kick out of that because, you know, there are mainframe computers around the world that are now gathering data at an exponential rate. Mm. And they're actually no one in the industry, the mainframe computer that makes up the cloud is known as the big iron. And that kind of got me thinking about the iron beast in the book of Daniel that would rule the world in the last days. But now they take this big iron that is basically one of the major influences in our world today, and they call it the cloud, like it's made out of Charmin or something. I mean, we have this misconception of how it's really nothing. It's this nebulous thing. No, it's not. It spans the globe. These data centers across every continent, under the oceans, in space, building something that could never have been built before in any generation. And I do tie that to the Tower of Babel, and I think it's demonstrable as well. 
Okay, Peter, let's just take it a little further because one of the big phrases that we're seeing all across the news and many people are wondering is AI, artificial intelligence. I was humored at first when one of our tech guys who helps us with the program, Nolan Benny, he, uh, he said to me, hey, do you want me to write a message for you? And, or do you want me to write the opening to the program for the perspective? It'll use your words, your language, your idea. And he clicked a button and poof, there it was. So that's almost, that was daunting. And all of a sudden I stopped smiling and I've been wondering, and I wanna ask you, how do you think artificial intelligence is linked to the Garden of Eden? Well, I think Daniel was the most amazing prophet, for me anyway, just he struck me since I first became a believer some 40 years ago. Um, and so I read and read, and what Daniel talked about, there would be an increase in knowledge in the last days. I was foolish enough to believe that it meant our knowledge, my knowledge, that I was going to somehow become smarter. Well, in turn out to be the case. <laughs> getting older, and I think I'm losing a step or two. Um, but if you take a look at the word for knowledge that Daniel used in the original Hebrew, that portion of Daniel was written in Hebrew, um, he uses the word doth. If I can just say it in Canadian, hadat is how you would uh, say the letters that spell that out. The word for knowledge in the original Hebrew is generally yada, and it's used over 900 times, almost a thousand times. That's not the word Daniel used, knowingly or unknowingly. He used a word that was only used seven times in the Old Testament. And the first time it was used referred to the tree of knowledge. So Daniel was saying, at the time of the end, knowledge, the tree of knowledge, shall, shall exponentially increase in the last days. Mm. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I think we're seeing that in the world today. And as you tie the technology together, and it's, this isn't just all about technology, but it's about mindsets. It's about delusions and deceptions that are coming upon the world in these days. And we talk about AI. This thing could fool any of us. I mean, it, I actually, I shouldn't say this. I, I chat to AI online on my computer all the time. And uh, it contradicts itself all over the place for one thing. But you can't really pull the wool over its eyes. It knows. And if it knows, whoever programmed it knows, mm -hmm. and whoever owns it knows, and that puts frightening power in the hands of some guys that I think we know are a little bit off their rocker um, in our world today, but power of control and manipulation unlike anything we've seen in any other generation. Mm -hmm. So I do think it sets the stage for man's attempt to build his own Tower of Babel. We don't want to do it God's way. We want to do it our way. And this is what the attempt is. So that's interesting. So d by saying this, do you think that the seal in Daniel 12 has already been broken? And for our viewers, explain the seal in the first place. Yeah, that's important. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, the angel said to Daniel, the book is sealed until the time of the end. I think the time of the end actually happened in 1948, and I'll give two interesting parallels. I think we all know that it's widely believed, I'll say, I certainly believe it, that the founding of the nation of Israel in 1948 was the birth of this last generation. Mm. We don't know how long it is, and it's been pretty confusing because everybody thought it was 40 years, then 50 years, and now we're at 73 years. Um, so it gets a little bit lost in that. But the fact is the first mainframe computer that we talked about was born within one month of the birth of Israel. Interesting. Um, the revived Roman Empire mm. was formed, revived, was reformed within weeks of mm. Israel. So 1948, a whole lot of stuff started happening very, very quickly. Um, and so I do believe that this tree of knowledge is a significant prophecy that is overlooked largely. Um, in the study of prophecy today. As a matter, I, I do a little thing on Facebook where I dress up as like an Indiana Jones character. <laughs> and, and I tell people, I found the tree of knowledge. And lots of people come and then they kind of giggle a bit. But the fact is, I have. And it's just not bark and leaves. It's mm. this great data cloud in the sky that it says will stomp and chew up the world. 
stomp it with its, its feet. And I will make mention that Daniel saw it as a iron beast with nails of brass. Mm. Take the Hebrew word for brass, it means serpent, hissing, lying. So we have a lot going on here all at once that I think ties together a rather large story. Mm. Well, Peter, we're going to jump in for a second. This is fascinating stuff. And we're going to come back to these thoughts right after a short break. For those of us who follow Jesus, we have a book. It isn't a theology book. It isn't a rule book. This book is a story. The story of God and humanity. A story Jesus said he was fulfilling. This book contains poems, riddles, letters, puzzling narratives, and new ideas. Yet, throughout it all, this book is full of the breath of God. For those of us who follow Jesus, this book is a treasure. This book is a tree of life. This book is a page turner. Turn the page with us. All right, we're talking today with Peter Lalonde from his new project, Bible Prophecy on Trial. And Peter, I want to jump in and ask you this question. What, if any, have your views changed since the release of your first film that started the Left Behind story series in 2014? I kind of say it facetiously to my friends now that I didn't know squat back then. <laughs> misunderstood the key prophecy about the increase in knowledge because we were talking about, look, we went from the Wright brothers to the space shuttle, and now we're driving around in faster and faster cars. Uh, look at us uh, running to and fro. And that wasn't what Daniel said at all. Mm -hmm. And so when I realized that that was wrong in my interpretation, and none of us saw it. I mean, I knew every guy who was a teacher of prophecy at that time. We didn't see this. You couldn't see this. It didn't exist yet. In 1995, there was no Google. I mean, you just didn't know any of this stuff was coming. So I think that became an increasing revelation for me that as I then began to study, I'm not talking about computers, about the word and about the times and the deceptions and the perceptions and the delusions of the last days and so powerful they would deceive even the very elect. That's a pretty strong statement. Mm -hmm. um, that I realized I needed to uh, begin to play a bigger role again, and that eventually it became leading to this. Peter, just unpack that one expression because uh, not everyone was going to understand it. When you talk about the delusion that it would even deceive the very elect, who are the elect? What is the delusion? I think the elect refers to all true believers. And I think the strong delusion is spelled out for us once again, going back to the original Greek. Um, the, the phrase for delusion parallels, I think the word is parasudai in mm -hmm. the Greek. And you go back and you look up that word and it has one other major occurrence, Romans 125. They served and worshiped the creature more than the creator. Mm. I think that's the heart of the end times delusion. And I think it's completely consistent. You know, we can say a lot of things about Lucifer. He's never changed his story. He fell from heaven saying, I'm like God. He went down to the Garden of Eden and said, hey, you can be like gods. You can live forever. The lie has never changed. It was the idea of why building the Tower of Babel. Mm. It's the lie in our world today. So we don't have to search around for what little thing it's going to be. We know what it's going to be. Now the question is, how is it going to come about in a way that will delude the entire world so um, dramatically? And yes, a part of it is technology. They talk about deep fakes and all of that kind of stuff. I don't buy that. This is Lucifer loosed on the world in the last days. He comes with a game we don't even understand. Mm -hmm. And I think what we need to be watching for is everything that points us in that direction. And as you look at the goals, of artificial intelligence and the metaverse and all of these things today, it is exactly that. You shall be as gods um, and you shall live forever. That's the cutting edge of where we're at today. And as I said, I don't think it's ever changed. So as you are sharing that, 
And I think a lot of our viewers are nodding their head in agreement, or at least just nodding, trying to say, how do I process all of this? Um, are there some other telltale signs that you think, hey, you know, here's a signpost, wake up. What are some of the things that stand out in your mind as we are moving in what you referred to as these end times? Well, I'm going back to Daniel again. And in the prophecies, in Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12, he doesn't talk about the church at all. He's talking about Israel and the time of Jacob's trouble. But he's then told when he sees all these signs of the tribulation period, he's told, but before all that comes, knowledge shall increase. Well, if we're at the stage right now, at this moment in history, when knowledge is increasing so dramatically, and it's not our knowledge, it tells me one thing, that if you're a believer in the rapture, it's imminent. It's at any moment now. The, we got a sign of the beginning of the tribulation period, not a sign of the rapture exactly. I understand that. But the fact is, we know that A and B go together, and we have signs of B. But I'd like to just add one element to that. I have a great many um, folks that I know within the body who do not believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. I don't really care. Um, if you're a believer, you're going whenever you're going, it's fine. Let's not, you know, almost have a fit over fighting about these things that are really not the core issue. And I think that's what can happen, that prophecy becomes a bit of a fetish for people, and we're arguing over this head and this horn and this beast and missing the big picture of what we're being told. So I think that's especially true of the rapture right now. I think it's imminent. I think it's pre-trib, but I'll certainly have fellowship with uh, folks who don't. So as we wrap things up here, I, I want to ask you, what's one thing you'd like to leave with our viewers that as, uh, let's say, as believers, uh, what should we be focusing on? Now? www.bibleprophecyontrial.com. Um, but mainly my point is, people say, ah, if it happens, it happens. You know, whatever, in terms of Bible prophecy, I don't have to pay attention to that stuff. But Jesus himself said, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. God said in Isaiah chapter 46, that by this you will know that I am God and the only God. I can tell you the end from the beginning and from the future, things that have not happened yet. I just quoted that poorly. Um, it's important. It's a third of the Bible. It's an important story for us to understand what the battles between. There's basically three narratives in our world today. There's God's narrative, which we get in his word and through the preaching and so on. There's Lucifer's narrative, which we're coming to know more and more clearly how relevant it is to these days. And then there's mankind's narrative, which is kind of a cross the arms and we're doing it our way. We're not having any of this. Those three are coming into conflict right now. And I think that's why it's important to understand prophecy, to understand why we believe what we believe, not about prophecy. That's not the big story here. The, 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 you know, you mentioned a concluding thought. Right next to the tree of knowledge was the tree of life. Mm. We're talking a little bit too much about the wrong tree in end times prophecy. Um, and that's what really has me excited, this idea of the imminent reality of this all coming to pass. Not all the negative stuff on earth, because I happen to believe we're going to be mostly gone. But the fact of the matter is the great and blessed hope. That's to be our hope of uh, eternity. What a great truth. Peter, I want to thank you for being with us. Uh, I'd love for you to come back on the program again. There's so much more to talk about, and it has literally been insightful what you've been sharing. Just tell us once again where people can track with you. Uh, yeah, uh, well, our website and where you can actually join as a juror on the trial is BibleProphecyOnTrial.com. And on Facebook, it's Bible, prof Bible Prophecy on Trial with Peter Lalonde. You can just type in Bible Prophecy on Trial and you'll be there on the Facebook page. And we do little encouraging updates every day. It's not kind of the heavy duty stuff, 
but it's the just remember the times in which we live and uh, who it is that holds us in his hands. Peter, thank you for being with us. Uh, We look forward to chatting again. Stay with us, folks. We'll be right back. Dude Perfect originated back in 2009. I very much had the attitude of, we've got to make hay while the sun's shining. Not sure that I managed it the best as far as a family perspective. We started trying for a baby and I miscarried several times and it was just devastating to me. You know, I'm watching my husband be on top of the world and I'm at home just broken. Something interesting that Peter said is that the Bible is about a third prophecy. And I found that very interesting because in my own research, I've done a lot of seeking out of the scriptures uh, dealing with prophecy about Jesus, the Messiah. And it's incredible when you go back and you see like, well, there's this, there's that. And it's like hundreds of years beforehand. And yet now you can look back and see that this is happening. All these pieces come together. So even if we don't understand everything that's happening today, we have enough proof of so much that has already been foretold and has happened. Yeah, and I think that's in key, those phrases, it has happened. And that becomes uh, a great foundation for us to build on. Mm-hmm. And, but Julie, if I could just add one other thing, as we talk about living in the last days, and I believe we are, one of the important things is say, how am I living in light of that? Right. With my priorities, my time, and what does it mean to keep Jesus yeah. at the center of my life? And if I can just talk to you today, it would be to encourage you to passionately seek after following God because nothing will be like it. He does not disappoint you. And the great news is this, he is coming back for those who love him. As we unpack what Peter Lalonde was sharing about living in the last days, one of the things that we need to be very cognizant of is the temptation not to be in the scriptures, not to be truly prepared for the days in which we are living in. Now, temptation is an interesting subject, and we're talking about it all this week. Sometimes there can be the temptation to just ignore what is happening all around us. But temptation also uh, impacts how you and I choose to live, the choices we make, the things that we do. And what God calls us to be as we live in these days is to be holy. Years ago, uh, Erwin Lutzer wrote a book. It was called, How in the World Can I Be Holy? I've never forgotten that subject, the title, because it really uh, describes some of the questions that we're afraid to ask. So how do I live this holy life? Well, one of the things is that God wants you and I to have victory over the areas that bring us down. Yesterday, we talked about strongholds and how strongholds can hold us down, whether it's be things of dealing with our appetite, things that we're lusting after and that just cause us to be driven, or maybe the desire for more power and recognition. Even though we don't often want to come out and admit that, it is very subtle. And yet the scripture teaches that pride uh, goes before a fall. And pride is the one thing that keeps us out of that close walk with God. Even as we reference what Peter has been saying, it can be our own arrogance that keeps us from recognizing that we are living in the last days, that somehow we are invincible, and that my own little world around me, hey, we're going to survive and we're going to press on. I want to take you to a verse of scripture, and it's found in Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Can I remind you, as we think about temptation, when you feel the urge to say yes, you can say no. And my goal in the teaching this week is to help you and I get a perspective on temptation so that you can handle it before it manhandles you. Now, what does Paul write about in Corinthians chapter 10? I want to read to you from the message translation. He says, don't be so naive and self-confident. You're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate God confidence. No test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. 
He will never let you be pushed past your limit. He's always will be there to help you come through it. What an incredible promise. But there are three things that I think we need to focus on that's found in this teaching. Three things about temptation. And perhaps it's the temptation that you're dealing with today. Maybe uh, it's over food. Someone once said that he who indulges bulges. Well, I don't need to say much more about that. But why am I craving food? What is it satisfying? How come I can't control that appetite? Or maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's even as you scroll through your phone, the things that you see there, the things that you allow yourself to dwell on as you're looking at your phone or you're looking at your screen. Or perhaps it's the temptation just to continue to hold a grudge against that person that has really uh, hurt or offended you. You're saying, is that temptation? Isn't that just my feelings? No, it's the temptation because God says, you know, we need to forgive those who have hurt us. We don't need to hold on to that boat anchor. It is just holding you down. So what do we find in Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13? Well, when it comes to temptation, you and I are not unique. Whether we've snuck an extra piece of cake like last night and hopefully your spouse didn't catch you, or maybe you've snuck a look at a woman and are hoping that no one, especially your wife, has seen you do that. Temptation is there. Temptation is always there. It comes in various shapes and forms, but you and I are not unique. And that's why the Bible says I have to daily renew my mind. I have to say, God, help me to stay focused so that even as I'm going through my phone and seeing my news feed or something else or something jumps up on the Facebook and I can go in a divergent way and I see a picture, I say, no, that is not going to be life-giving. And I find I have to ask that question, is this going to draw me closer to God or is it going to take me further away? The second thing that comes out of this passage about temptation is that God won't give you more than you can handle. I believe that applies to things, whether it's money, sex, or power, but I also believe it implies the things that we journey through in life. Some of those hardships where we're tempted to shake our fists and say, God, why are you allowed this to happen? Or I'm just going to reject you because you haven't answered my prayer the way that I wanted you to answer them. He says he's not going to give us more than we can handle. And the last thing he says is that he will provide an escape plan. He will provide a way out. For Joseph in the Old Testament, when he was tempted to be involved in a sexual relationship outside of marriage, what did he do? He chose to run. Doesn't sound like a too exciting escape plan. Maybe you have to run. Maybe you have to put down your phone, turn off your computer, put more screens on it. Maybe you have to deal with that attitude that you know is just tearing you down. But God says he will give you an escape plan. Ask his spirit to teach you about what it is. He wants you to experience victory.